Tom, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Um, yes, welcome me. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So we're going to talk about the recent, uh, the Slate Star Codex blog. There was a, I mean, it's a backstory. We're going to have to fill in a lot of gaps because this goes back at least sort of six to eight months. But just a few days ago, the New York Times brought out a long awaited piece about the blog Slate Star Codex. And this yeah. is a very high profile blog, especially in the rationalist community. And we'll kind of explain why that's significant, who the rationalists are. And it's probably fair to say it's one of the most influential blogs in the world. Would that be fair? Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, depend, depending on how you define blog, I suppose. But yes, yes, I think that is probably true. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for joining me. You are literally the man who wrote the book on the rationalists. Yes, yes, I did. Yes. Just to summarize maybe about why this is significant. For mm. me, it taps into many different issues. Um, it's about sort of the, te- the decline of the traditional media or the tensions of the traditional media versus kind of the upstart alternative media. Mm. Um, it's a very influential, important community, the rationalists, which we'll talk about yeah. in a bit. And as you pointed out in a really good piece you wrote for Unheard, it's also about a kind of way of dealing with ideas we don't like, whether we engage with them or whether we kind of, whether we don't, and the art of persuasion, which you argue is something that is quite rare yeah. in that piece. Should we tell the backstory first, just to fill in the gaps? Last June, well, it was very obvious that this rationalist community, Scott and Scott Alexander in particular, but uh, you know the, the rationalist community more widely, had done a lot better than most people at predicting um, or sort of preparing for the COVID pandemic. They were ahead of everyone on, look, masks are, masks are a good idea. Um, this is probably aerosol transmitted rather than fomite transmitted. It, 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 they just made, you know, shutting borders might be a good idea. That's something they, they, um, they made, they did the sort of, they had the sort of numerical thinking and the sort of quantified thinking that made them able to do these judgments much better. And, and that attracted interest. And this guy from the New York Times, Cade Metz, is a tech reporter there, he um, got interested in that. People had said to him, look, this blog, Slate Star Slate Codex, has got these interesting people. It, um, uh, it, you know, and it's been out ahead of all the COVID stuff and it's worth um, paying attention to that. And so he went and he started, tried to start speaking to a rationalist. He came and spoke to me. He tried to speak to Scott. Scott did exchange emails with him. I don't think spoken in person or spoken on the phone, but exchange email. And I think the... Um, and this was, as far as I was concerned, it was looking like it was going to be quite a, a positive piece. But then something happened, which was New York Times said, you, if, if you remember, Scott Alexander is a pseudonym. It's a sort of thin pseudonym. It's just his first and middle names. And if you put in a bit of effort, it's quite easy to work out who his real name. But New York Times said, well, we're going to reveal your real name. And... Scott Alexander said, well, that's a terrible idea because I am a psychiatrist and I need to maintain a relationship with my patients. Um, and if my name is splashed all over the internet, that becomes harder, which has been proved to be the case with, for other psychiatrists in the past and struck me as a pretty reasonable point of view. But the but New York Times said, no, we must name you. It's just, just our policy. There was some back and forth over whether that is actually their policy because they don't seem to name everyone. But anyway, you know, by, by the by. Um, and so Scott... I, th- I think it's fair to say panicked or certainly got spooked and took down his entire blog, five, what, seven years of work and um, uh, put up a post instead saying uh, they're going to dox me and it's threatening my safety. And I am basically, you know, I'm scared. And so I'm, 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 hi- I'm, I'm taking it all off the internet until, um, until this goes away. Uh, and then I think in a really, basic tactical error i think i really I, i'm for sure he is disappointed like I, I, I think he regrets this he said in a piece that he regrets it anyway um he then asked his readers to email cave metz and cave metz's editor tech editor at the new york times to say please don't dox him and of course that means you get some poor people get five thousand emails in their inbox the next day and it's just, and, and anyway from there it was suddenly you've got an antagonistic relationship there's also an issue that there are quite a lot of people on the internet who really don't like Slate Star Codex, um, uh, the blog, the Slate Star Codex, and and Scott Alexander, and they and they uh, were sort of tr- 
whispering they would they would they then became contacts with Cave Metz and saying look he's actually you know suggesting that he's actually linked to a whole bunch of scientific racists and uh he's actually men's rights activists and neo-reactionaries and all these things which are I would either say false or true in a misleading way but you know that's that's an argument for further down the line um uh and then this whole massive row broke out this was last June other other media organizations including you know got involved the new york new yorker wrote a really interesting piece about the whole thing and then everything went quiet for seven or eight months scott alexander quit his job out out, out of all this thing he decided what the sensible thing to do was to quit his job as a psychiatrist set up his own practice run it differently and move his blogging thing to substack so that he could get money and not worry about making money from things so he totally reordered his life so that he was not no longer afraid to put his his real name out there put his real name out there about three weeks ago or something like that or a month ago and then um and restarted on, on substack still blogging and then that all done then the new york times finally published its piece saying this is the guy's name and uh he shut off his blog and it was all a bit uh, uh, the, uh, when the new york times piece came out it was all a bit of an anticlimax and there wasn't actually that much there except a few somewhat to my mind guilt by association smears you know like this guy wants mentioned uh charles murray on his blog that sort of thing and it felt felt all like a bit of a damp squib in the end but yeah so that's where i think i think that's where we are now i think in your piece you said that you had actually spoken to to scott and recommended that he speak to to cave metz at the time that you you thought it you thought it was going to be a positive piece i did yeah i am um, I don't know whether I misjudge. I I, I I I I I emailed Scott or had an exchange of emails with Scott and had um, a uh and, and posted some posted some things on the Slate Star Codex subreddit and things and just sort of discussed it because I I, I don't know I, I I it may be that I'm a total rube right and I'd got absolutely taken like a sucker but I did not get I got the impression from speaking to Metz that. Um, he was really interested in how the rationalists had been sort of so far out, out ahead on COVID and things. And that was, and it, you know, I think that's a really interesting thing because these are, it just, they, these were not, it's not a community of epidemiologists or virologists or anything. Uh, it's a community of smart generalists who are comfortable with numbers and who could look, to, who did some, you know, really basic things like look at an exponential trend and expend, extend that ex exponential trend upwards, you know, and say, well, if this carries on, we should be really worried about it when other people were, you know, and, and it's really, I think that is a really interesting, there's a really interesting discussion there about knowledge and expertise and the difference between expertise and forecasting ability. I think that's a fascinating topic, which I would love someone to really go into in great depth. There was also, I mean, because the New Yorker wrote this piece, this really sort of well-balanced and interesting piece about six months ago, which was neither fawning to the rationalists nor, you know, it was no, nor uncharitable. It was, and I feel like the New New York Times, when its piece came out, it couldn't just write the same piece the New Yorker had six months ago and say it was, um, uh, you know, that's what we're doing now. It had, it had to come with some new angle. So I think it, that's why the it went down on the... Um, uh, guilt by association stuff, but also on it, it, most of the piece seemed to be about about how the, the blog was deleted and how you know then and now it's come back and some people sent emails to Cade Metz and I, I don't know it felt like very um it felt like they didn't have very much to say but it felt they had to say it anyway I don't think he went in there with the, with the intention of a hatchet job I think he went in there trying to write about an interesting group group of people who have had this interesting. Um, sort of been out there ahead of uh, the game on COVID. And I think that uh, for reasons which I both, which I understand um, and to some, yeah, to, to, to some extent sympathise with insofar as it was this sort of mutual antagonism thing and a lot of burning bridges on both sides and a lot of people who weren't Scott Alexander throwing around a lot of, you know, the, the journalists are all evil and we're all caught doing hatchet jobs. It became this sort of mutually antagonistic thing. And then it was always going to be a somewhat antagonistic antagonistic piece after that. I mean, I'm interested in this tension between the, and, and we're talking about the links to the tech companies here as well. And this also feeds into the, the growing tension between the tech companies and especially the New York Times, but 
tech journalists more generally, where, and I think at the root of this is that journalists believe that they should be the gatekeepers about what people should, yeah. where what ideas should be part of the conversation and what shouldn't be. And that was kind of the, the subtext of that, of that piece was, oh, he's talked to these people, he's engaged in these ideas. And, and that's very, very anti both the rationalists and also the sort of the, the dominant sort of strain of kind of maybe ideological libertarianism in Silicon Valley as well. And I feel like that way of that sort of gatekeeping role of the media that is increasingly being lost is sort of, for me, that seems like a, a defunct strategy because we're never going to get the genie back in the box. The nature of kind of alternative media or decentralized media means we now have a, mar- a much wider marketplace of ideas. And the whole the whole way of saying you mustn't talk to this person, or you mustn't think about this, or you mustn't engage with this, mm. just isn't going to work anymore. So I think I think in a broader strategy, we have to engage with bad ideas, or we have to engage with kind of ideas that are beyond the mainstream, if only to say why they're not, why they're disreputable, or why they won't work, or why they they're, they're wrong. Whereas the, the 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 media, I think, still has this idea that we can kind of circumscribe the the bounds of thought, and that journalists are the right ones to do that. As you say, there is there are lots of other ways the information to get around, and I think there is an element of in the media of thinking that well, this is somehow bad. This is you know we we were before filtering the the acceptable versions of these of this information to you, and now and you know, any idiot with a WordPress account or a Twitter account. But I think I don't know. Insofar as journalists do believe that they overestimate their own ability to filter things well, because like we are no cleverer or better on the whole than any reasonably smart group of people, you know? And, uh, and I think, um, uh, and I think that is, we, we, we're misjudging our own abilities if we think that we we are the only safe route from wh- through which these ideas can be filtered. And I think that actually things like the rationalist approach are, I think it's really useful when 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 they go and sort of look look investigate these things in 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 depth and in a way that mainstream journalism isn't set up to do. You couldn't have a thirty thousand word New York Times piece about the ideas of the reactionaries. It just it wouldn't it wouldn't fit like that. You couldn't make that go anywhere. In and and the the idea and and there's also I mean we have in journalism we have sort of traditions which are hard to get out of but are also not always easy to justify when you're coming to them fresh like you can never write i am not sure about this very easily in a in a news article or a um uh or certainly a comment piece you have to sort of present this godlike status of omniscience like i i come to you with my tablets from the mount and and I, one of the great things about the rationalist community is they will write blog posts saying, I am, I am only 60 percent confident in this i'm not sure if i've understood it correctly you know and and there's much more and i and they they uh, they go and take it from a totally different point of view that is not bred by three you know two centuries of journalistic tradition and it's just some people making it afresh and then they make uh, that i'm sure they make a lot of the same mistakes that we would make without you know it looks a lot of the reason these true journalistic traditions have sprung up for a reason but they also bring in new fresh ways of doing it which i think are really useful and i, I so yes so this is a very long way of saying yes i absolutely agree there is a gatekeeper aspect to the media partly that is um a a matter of just how the media was before there wasn't any other way for information to get around uh, but there is a tendency to think that it is not that it is more than just an accident of history and that we are somehow meant to be doing it and we are the best ones to do it and i'm not sure that's true at all the piece uh, as we said was called silicon valley safe space and kind of gave the idea that it was if not an ideological monoculture then at least specifically hostile to social justice ideas do you think that was a fair summary of the rationalist perspective or that blog in particular? No. No, I I definitely don't. I think I think if you do um uh because they're nerds, right? They do surveys. Um the Less Wrong blog and Slate Star Codex did annual surveys of their readers for years. Um I don't I couldn't really I couldn't work out the find out the 2020 data very easily I had a look at it recently but um 2019 data had uh liberals and so well, self-described social democrats and liberals you know the um uh so left what Americans would call liberals and British would call left I think you know democrats outnumbered conservatives 
self-described by eight to one. Uh, there's like there was about half as many libertarians as there were liberals, so they were a non-trivial number, but they were still a, a small minority. The rule is you can discuss almost anything; they'll ban you for certain topics. But in the slate sarcodex thing, you can as long as you are polite and um, not trying to start a fight, then you are broadly allowed to talk about anything, and that leads to a very rare situation where you get people who disagree with each other and sort of talking in the same space. And then if you are someone who's just used to never seeing anyone talk, saying, well, I think feminism is a, you know, the online feminism is, has, has gone wrong or is a bad thing or whatever, you know, then even seeing one will leap out at you. And that will be like, that's what I remember from the 500 comments, the three that said that, you know, it's got that on it. And, um, and then you think, well, this, uh, you know, just by the, workings of the availability heuristic you know just the workings of your mind that'll be what you remember and that'll be what you think of as the whole there's the whole um sort of tenor of the of the debate and there's the other side as well which is that if you are not allowed to say certain discuss certain topics in a lot of the, uh, the areas but you are allowed to as long as you're polite in this area then you will then people who aren't allowed to discuss their ideas elsewhere will tend to come there yeah and i think i share a little bit of like I'm I'm not a free speech absolutist. I see a lot of that, especially on YouTube. And I think that the tech companies do need to take more responsibility, for example, with um, some more, more sort of journalistic and curatorial moderation responsibility. I do share some of the concerns that are being expressed by the sort of more journalistic side. But I also think that it's a losing battle if you're trying to circumscribe certain topics as off as off the table because that 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 horse has bolted mm. and i think we need to kind of act knowing that that horse has bolted there was a really interesting tweet that i saw um where someone talked about the off ramp so there's a lot of talk about the on ramp to bad ideas and i yeah. think this is sort of this was the tone of that piece was the, mm. the rationalists are an on ramp to bad ideas because they engage with these other communities that have more reprehensible ideas but this point the point that was made is we don't talk a lot about the off ramp and yet the off-ramp has to exist as well. And I, I remember there were even some studies that were done into the effect of, I think this was specifically Jordan Peterson's ideas. Mm. That they, they, they tracked kind of comments and, and basically concluded that people had gone from watching Jordan Peterson's content to watching more extreme content. But then if you looked at the methodology, and that may be true, that may not be true, we're not sure, but they didn't check the other way. So they didn't do... So it basically was only looking at one at one side of that of that equation, and and a lot of people who follow Jordan Peterson's content would say that he has de-radicalized people as well. And mm. there's no that that but the but the study only looked at the at the on ramp effectively. And this is really interesting, I think, because this is what you were pointing to in your piece: is you have to engage with these ideas, you have to kind of potentially persuade people away from from them, otherwise. Like, what, what do you make of that kind of like the off ramp as an idea? Just I think it's really important. Discourse. I, th I think yeah, we we're talking about uh, were we were talking about persuasion. We were, and the, the idea of the uh, the that I, one of the things I love about Slate Star Codex is writing is that it will try and approach people who disagree with the point it's making and say, look, I, you know, it's not just boo out group. It's not saying, look, how you know, aren't you smart for already agreeing with me? And it's look, here is something which you probably don't agree with. I will try to change your mind. So this ties back to what you're saying about the um extremism thing or at least the you know the people see it as people see it and it's always the left that sees this as this sort of gateway drug slippery slope everyone will will read an article saying perhaps um jezebel behaved badly at some point and therefore they'll slide from there into men's rights activism or whatever you know i'm being flippant i shouldn't be but you know that sort of thing it's always going to be the slide from left to right into into right rightist extremism but the point of Slate Star Codex was it is trying to persuade everyone to agree with Slate Star Codex, which is obviously, you know, as we all are, we're all trying, you know, the, um, we want people to agree with. It. And so it was it was reaching out to people on the right. So, and the libertarians are saying, you know, actually, no, libertarian, you know, the, it is, you can be too libertarian. You get these, if, if there is, you know, there are flaws with these. There, you, Trump voting, Trump to reaching out to Trump voters, reaching out, and it is, it is pulling people towards this, towards the positions that Slate Star Codex holds, which are not extremist right wing and therefore the the it ends up um it ends up neither sort of uh, it, it, yes it moves people who are left of slate star codex right if that is a meaningful thing but it also move people right of slate star codex left and it brings you so yes it has it has this anti-extremism 
effect, or certainly um, it seems likely to me, and, and Scott Alexander could point to those people, the comments on his uh, anti-Trump blog uh, post about it. So yes, I think I think the I think the off ramp is a real and I think important phenomenon, and I would love someone to do some sort of quantification, you know, of it because I this is just me sharing anecdotes. But yes, I think it is a real thing. And just before we close, is there anything more that you wanted to say? Is there anything more that people should know about the rationalists that you think they probably don't? I think the their their ability, their predictions over COVID, their sort of tendency to be out ahead of the game has been really noteworthy. As This is the piece that Cade Metz, I wish he had written. And I think that is very much to do with this tendency to not go with a herd you know, back in January last year, to January 2020, the media were all writing the same pieces of, you know, don't worry about COVID, worry about the flu. Don't, you know, this, you know, this is not, you know, it's, and, and right, saying, you know, if everyone worrying about this, the over, over panicking about um, COVID as being sort of anti-Chinese racist and everything like that. And I think this was because the media... And I'm, I'm as guilty as this event as anyone, right? Uh, of you don't want to look like the idiot who panics. You don't want to look like the guy who goes, "Ah, it's all terrible," and then, then nothing happens. You, it's safe to do, to stay with your herd and not not look like you're um, straying outside of it, even if an exponential, even if it's a simple, <laughs> simply following the extra dots on the exponential curve would have told you that actually this is going to be around the world in six weeks. You know that that would have been should not have been beyond the wit of someone who can do GCSD maths, right? The, um, and I think the the ability to follow these arguments, these, you know, I mean, in that case, barely an argument, but the maths, but it does involve also sort of understanding of sort of some of the theory as well, beyond uh, to, to logical conclusions and not be swayed away from them by um, uh group think is a dismissive way of putting it but you know the sort of the, the social pressures to say to not look like you're panicking to not look like you're scaremongering i felt that that is a really interesting topic and it is it is the same mechanism that you see with their fears about ai i think uh and this is what i wrote in the end of my book is about um but they when you follow their arguments about ai it is very hard to see where they are wrong, right? It's very hard to go, okay, look, well, you, yeah, you, the, 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 the AI does go wrong in these ways. It is get rapidly getting more powerful and, and you know, the, um, the uh, AI researchers, if you interview them, do think you'll probably have superhuman AI in the next 80 years and, you know, my children's lifetime and that it will probably, um, and there is a decent chance of really, really terrible outcomes while also a decent chance of very, very, positive outcomes you know um but there's just as with just as with covid um there's this really str- i found it much i noticed it and wrote about it myself there's really strong well this is just weird right this is weird this does not this is not the sort of thing that i think is real this is not the sort of thing that happens in the world but they all they've done is doing the same thing pretty much extend a trend line out on a graph and take some basic theory points and, uh, and uh, some fairly uncomfortable and say, well, if all these things are true, which you agree with, then you extend it out and you end up with a, a disastrous outcome in 50, 80, 100 years time. And we need to do something about that. And I think that, and they, they also, for what it's worth, have been banging on for years about a bioengineered pandemic being that, that and, well, no, a, 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 being the real, uh, other great risk to human uh, of human extinction that and AI and then also generally the risk of global pandemics they, this is stuff they have been talking about and I, so I think it it is a the COVID stuff is a really good reminder that actually this sort of viewpoint that is not as we as I as the media as humanity has a tendency to do a sort of um, ste- steering away from ideas that seem uncomfortable because they're weird or because they're not you know they're, they're not what sort of thing we talk about normally and don't want to look scared don't want to look panicky don't want to look like we're socially um out you know outside the herd sometimes it's, it's really useful having people around who don't think like that and who do just take the trend line and extend it out and say well no but mm, hang on this means that we're all going to be in, locked up in our houses in three weeks time maybe we should be thinking about that and i think 
that should be a bit of a reminder to at least not dismiss their fears about stuff like bioengineered pandemics or uh, AI and the and the human extinction stuff because I think it the same mechanisms are in play in both places. That would be my that would be what I would say. Since the beginning of Rebel Wisdom, we've been thinking about how to create spaces for people to have new kinds of conversations around big ideas, which is why we've just launched our digital campfire, which is a central place for people to gather, to find the others, and to make sense together. It's a place to practice the skills we talk about on the channel. So we have regular sessions that help us improve our sense making and also tap into our collective intelligence. And it's all hosted on a discussion platform called Circle, where you can have conversations around our films and articles or on any other topic you're interested in. We've designed it all to be participatory, so you can set up real-time conversations by creating a crew to dive deeper into different topics or practices. So we've got three different levels of membership, Wise Rebel, Explorer, and Sensemaker. All three levels have access to the digital campfire on Circle. And the Explorers also have access to the following official Rebel Wisdom Run sessions. So on Mondays, we have live sense making, which is a session where we come together to discuss a hot cultural topic. And then on Tuesdays, we have our Academy sessions, where we have some of the best facilitators in the world teaching various skills. So for example, collective intelligence practice, facilitation training. Then on Thursday, we have our Connection Gym. And the sense makers are also invited to our Wednesday sessions, which alternates between Q&A and the Wisdom Gym. The Q&A is with one of the stars of our films and will often go up on the channel itself. And the Wisdom Gym is where we bring in some of the biggest names in transformation and growth to share their practices with us. Within Circle, we've also included a number of resources that we found useful. So sense making tools, meditations, authentic relating games, and guides for how to host your own session. So the most important thing to remember is that this is an experimental space and is designed to be participatory. So it's really your space to come in and make your own. So we'd love to see you there.